Amen. John chapter 8, when you find your, found your place, I'll invite you to stand today. We're going to read verses 3 through 11. John chapter 8, verses 3 through 11. The Bible says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? They said, this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they, con so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, being beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What we have before us this morning, one of the most well-known and yet I think most abused passages found in, in the four Gospels, the story of the woman taken in adultery. And who knows how many millions of times this passage has been quoted to um, excuse sin and, uh, and to condemn a sincere believer who doesn't simply excuse it away. Um, sometimes it'll happen like that. A person will say, uh, you know, to a Christian who's standing on the Word of God and saying that there is sin and that we ought to repent of sin and turn from sin and we ought to change your life and they'll say well that's not what the Bible teaches and Jesus didn't condemn the woman and you shouldn't condemn us either and that kind of a thing happens on a, on a regular basis it seems like and there is in this passage um, an enormous amount of hope uh, because here is a woman who's found guilty who's taken in the in the act of a sin and yet uh, she's not condemned when the story's over she's not condemned and so there is an enormous amount of hope for you and I when we sense our guilt and, and our sin and by the way every one of us ought to uh, ought to realize our sin condition our sin nature well not to try to put it away and and hide it and excuse and and uh, you know and, and ignore the fact that we're sinners well Jesus loves sinners and I'm a sinner and therefore I'm okay and Let's don't talk about sin. We ought to, if we're going to ever really deal with um, the, the, the sin in our life and the, and the problems in our life, we're going to have to just come face to face with sin. We're going to have to stop trying to hide it and ignore it. We're just going to have to say, this is what's true of me. And, and we're going to have to do that. And, and, uh, and yet once we come to a place where we understand that we are sinners, then now we're in a place where we can properly understand what it means to when Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee. Uh, we've got to come to a place where we, have, where we, we, we see our sin um, uh, full on before we can actually get the, the blessing and receive the blessing of knowing that Jesus has not condemned us. And so here's a, a passage with immense, enormous hope. Uh, there is in this passage encouragement for the wayward, the person who's not right with God and they know that they're not right with God. There's, there's, uh, there is hope and encouragement for that person. But there's also in this passage of scripture uh, an, an urging to a different life. This passage is not telling you and I that we can continue on in a life that, is, that, is, uh, that has sin in it, that is, that is contrary to what God's Word teaches. And this is not a passage that says, well, I know that, I, that teaches us, well, I know that I'm a sinner, but this is the way I am, and God loves me anyway, and so I can continue on in my life. This passage tells us that there is such a thing as forgiveness. It tells us that there is such a thing as justification, that there is such a thing as no condemnation before God, but then there is also this thing of repentance and turning and, and having a changed light way of life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that is a very definite truth in the Bible. We like the fact, the idea that, you know, uh, well, the Bible doesn't condemn me. God doesn't condemn me. And therefore, you know, I'm okay to do what I like. But uh, sometimes we miss that part in the Bible where he says, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are, are, are become new. So very 
very often when you read this passage of scripture, the other thing that will happen here is not only will there be this thing, well, you're not supposed to be condemning. The other thing that will happen very often uh, when this passage is preached or taught from is, um, you know, the, we'll, we'll redirect the focus uh, away from the woman and uh, we'll either focus on her accusers and, well, those rotten accusers. You know, what are they doing? And, or we'll redirect the focus to her accomplice. Um, uh, I'm going to try instead to stick to, I think, who are the, those who are the two focal characters in this passage. Number one is the Lord Jesus Christ, and then number two is, is the woman herself. And uh, I've just got four things I want to share with you today. It won't be very long. I don't, think, I don't envision this message being a long one. Uh, but four things I want to give to you out of this passage this morning. Number one, let's just get right to it and, say, and, just, and just come out with it and say, this woman, she's caught. She's, she is caught. There's no question about it. Look at verses 3 and 4. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And so there's no getting around her sin. There's no trying to prove that she's innocent. It's not one of those deals where someone's accused her and she says, Yeah, but I'm not really guilty of what they've accused me of. There isn't anything like that a few years ago. This would have been a lot of years ago. Um, in fact, it was the first year, I think the first winter that we spent uh, here in Puyallup. Uh, I took a, a group of men to a men's retreat up on uh, Highway 12. And on the way up to the men's retreat, uh, you know, there were about four, of, four guys, I think, on, in my car. And I hit a, a, a stretch of black ice and I lost control of my car, totaled my car. And, um, and, and you know, we're alongside the road with cars totaled. No one was hurt. And I, I had the, the people that were with, Brother Sunquist was in the car. And so he can attest that this is what happened. So we're, the car, I mean, there is no part of the car that isn't damaged except for the roof. All of the windows are blown out. The, air, the uh, airbag is deployed. The back door has popped open and it's broken. The four doors on the sides. The, every, everything on the car has been damaged except the roof of the car. And we have one guy in the car. He looks at the, assesses the issue and says, you know what? Really, this car is drivable. All we got to do is get a tire. And so, so we can still make it to the retreat. All we got to do is get a tire, you know, change the tire real quick. And we can still, we can just drive it right to the retreat. You know, airbag, cut off the airbag, you know, cut it out and we, we, we can get it there. Well, I I'm, I'm, was really glad, Brother Sunquist wasn't the one who did the ask, suggested that. But I was really glad that before that happened, the state patrolman showed up. And, uh, and then I wasn't glad because the state patrolman wrote me a ticket. <laughs> and so you were obviously driving too fast for the conditions. If you got, you know, wreck, do this to your car, you're obviously driving. Well, obviously... I didn't know it was too fast. I was only doing like 35, 40 miles an hour. You know, I just, anyway, obviously it was too fast, but I didn't know. Anyway, so he gave me a ticket. Now I got to, I got to go to court, you know, because I've got a ticket. And Anita, uh, Anita thinks, says, Caleb is right now, he's in class. He needs to learn about government. And this will be a great opportunity <laughs> for, for Caleb to see government in action. <laughs> Anita, <laughs> government in action against me. <laughs> anyway, so, but uh, so it works out. We go to the court, and it's down in Central. We go to court, and and um, and what they do, you know, you go there, and you gotta, you show up any time. You show up at eight o'clock, and you're gonna, your time hearing will be anywhere between eight and noon, is what you know. And so you gotta hear all these other great cases. And so we gotta hear some very interesting cases. And one of them was a guy who comes up, and he said, you know, he's gotten a speeding ticket for going too fast on I five, and and he comes up to for the judge, and he says, I am not contesting that, that uh, someone was driving too fast. I am just contesting that it was me. And he tells the story. He says, I'm driving down the freeway and this car, this car passes me, just flies by me like I'm standing still. And the next thing I know, a state, patro state uh, patrolman pulls me over and gives me a ticket for driving too fast. I wasn't the one who was driving too fast. It was the car that got away that was driving too fast. And uh, the, uh, the judge said, well, you know, since uh, the officer isn't here to say you're wrong, um, then you must be right. And, um, and he let him go. I thought, oh, there's hope. <laughs> and it worked out for me. But the, only say, the whole point of telling that story was, you know, this woman can't say it wasn't me. I mean, there's no way that she can argue against this thing. It's her. There's no question about it. It's her. She was taken in the very act of adultery, and there were witnesses to attest that she was guilty, and, 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 and there's no argument about that. I noticed that she doesn't even try to prove or argue her innocence. That doesn't happen in this passage at all. And, 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 and right here, she is a perfect representative for the condition that every human being ever born on this earth is in, because we are all sinners caught in the act 
and we have no excuse, no argument. There's no way we can prove our innocence. It's worthwhile. It's worthless to try to argue our innocence because it's we're not, and we know it. I mean, there's no reason to try to deny it or plain or or to try to justify it or talk it away. We know it. Every one of us know it. In fact, I think one of the most difficult things that Christians face in their life is 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 that is that way to reconcile the fact that God says that we've been forgiven, and yet we know that we're still sinners. And I think that that's one of the most difficult things that some Christians ever deal with. And there's always this thing, I know what Bibles, the Bible says, and I know that God said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord should be saved. And I know that he says that he has taken my sins and removed them uh, behind his back, and they're as far away as the east is from the west, and they're buried in the depths of the sea, and that he'll never remember them again. I know that he says that, but I remember them. I can't get away from them. I think about them every day. And, and, and here's this woman. She knows she's a sinner caught in the act. She re represents every single one of us as human beings on the faces of this earth. The Bible says, Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse uh, 3, verse 23, Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the, uh, of the, the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 and verse 9, we have before proved, he says, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all all under sin. No reason to argue this thing. No reason to deny it. We can, uh, it would do no good to try to excuse our sins. All of us have sinned. It's just the truth. We're guilty. We're, we're guilty of sins we wished we didn't do. Isn't that true? That there are things that you have done or do that you wish you didn't do. That, you, that there are sins that you're guilty of and, and in your heart and maybe, maybe even more on the surface. Maybe you'd even be able to speak it out and say it like this. I just wished I didn't have this problem. I wish that this sin wasn't in my life. That I didn't have this bondage or this addiction or, or, or this compulsion in my life. I wish there, we were guilty of sins we wished we didn't do. We're also guilty of sins that we know are sins but we like anyway. I know what the Bible says and I know what the church says. I know what pastor preaches but I don't think this is that wrong. And all of us are usually guilty of something like that. There's something that we think is okay even though we know the Bible says it's not okay. And, and we're guilty of those kind of sins. We're also guilty of sinning by nature, by habit and by the scores. You know, we just, I mean, it's just, uh, the, the, if it, Wake up in the morning if uh, all else, other things being equal, we're just going to sin. <laughs> I mean, it's just going to be that way. You know, you put us in a position. I get up in the morning. The very first thing I do in the morning is, is a, a time of devotions. I spend time with God in His Word and, um, and in prayer and, um, and writing down some of the things, you know, that, um, that I want my life to be like. And, and the very first thing I do is spend time doing those things and, and spending time with God to try to prepare myself spiritually and emotionally and mentally and physically so that I'm, so that I'm ready to walk with God during the day, but invariably something will happen during the day that catches me by surprise and when it catches me by surprise my first response isn't oh I think I'll do the godly thing my first response is the ungodly thing and then I have to make myself think oh the godly I should do the godly thing instead Sometimes I catch myself before I do the ungodly thing. Sometimes I don't. But I, every one of us face that. You know, we just, it's in our nature to sin. We're sinners by nature. And, and it might be that our sin nature is, you know, the sins that we're guilty of are not the kinds, you know, uh, things that uh, you talk about out loud, you know, the kind of things that are, uh, you know, you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be the subject of conversation. It might be that um, the sins that we're, convic that we're guilty of are things that we would like to ignore or cover up or in some way contain and control you know just you know just want to have this thing I know that I'm guilty of it but I just want to I want to suppress it so that while I'm guilty of it it doesn't become an issue in my life where other people know about it and that kind of thing um, some people prefer to address their their sins um, with different names you know they've got a sin problem and they know that they have a sin nature and they commit sins but they but you know because they've got this sin nature that they're kind of dominates them and they don't like it so they try to give it a better name you know so it sounds better you know uh, well my sin it's an illness our world is filled with that kind of thinking right now let's just we will relabel sin We'll call it illness. It's an illness. And, an, you know, illness, people get colds. You don't really judge them for having a cold. Do you? Well, unless they come to church with it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
you might judge that, you know. <laughs> you know. But most of the time, we don't judge people, you know, if they have a cold, you know, someone calls up and says, I'm, you know, they're sniffling, oh, I'm sorry, I've got a cold today. And you don't say, oh, you wicked person, because they have a cold, you don't do that. And so, you know, it's an illness, they're just sick, you know. And so sometimes we do, we've done, our society has done that, and they, we've relabeled uh, sin, bondage, addictions, and, and we call it, you know, it's an illness, or sometimes, you know, even the word addiction. Sounds better than, well, I'm, you know, well, I'm just a sinner. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, and, you know, even that sounds better. Or sometimes we'll use the word failure, you know. And there are times, I think there's a difference between a sin and a failure. I think there are some things that we do that are failures, not sins, but they're failures, shortcomings. But those are terms that we'll use sometimes for our sin because we really don't like the sin in our life and we know that it's there. We don't like it and we're really embarrassed by it. We don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want to be open, outspoken, and confronted with our sins, so we come up with names like illness and addiction and failure and weakness and shortcomings, you know, those kinds of terms, because just trying to find a better way to address it than, than call it what it really is. It's sin, and it's sin against God. And so, but, it, you know, it doesn't matter what you name it, it's all the same. We come short of the glory of God. So what sin is, it's we come short of the glory of God. We do not measure up to the purpose for which God created us. That's what sin is, and she's caught. She's caught in her sin. She's, it's, it's obvious, she can't get around it, she can't excuse it. They've caught her in the middle of her sin, and so have you and I have been caught. God knows. Even if we've been able to hide it from everyone else, even if we've been able to cover it up from our family and from our friends and from our co-workers and from the people we know in church, whatever, uh, God knows. God knows all about our sins. She's caught. But notice, secondly, not only is she caught, but then she's confronted in verse 2 again. Uh, I'll use verse 2. Um, it says in early, uh, verse 2, is that the one I really want? Um, yeah, verse 3 and the, scribes, and the scribe and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken brought unto Jesus brought unto him a woman taken in adultery and set her in the midst so they bring her to Jesus Christ and they set her right there in the middle and tell Jesus what she did I mean now that's pretty rude you already don't like what you did. You've been caught and you're not upset. And you're ashamed that you've been caught. You've done something that, that you know is not going to be... I mean, no one in society is going to like what she's done and everyone is going to judge her for what she's done. And why can't you just say, we caught you, just, you know, we'll deal with this thing uh, kind of hush-hush and we're going to deal with it. We're gonna, why do they have to take her through the streets of the city, bring her to Jesus Christ, who is the very Son of God, and tell Jesus what I did. Why do they have to do that to her? And, and conf you know, but what's happening here is she's being confronted with her sin. She's not being allowed to just, um, you know, sin and go on, but she's being confronted with her sins. And, and you might want to at first take the position that the only reason she was in front of Jesus is because of the wicked scribes and Pharisees. They judged her and Jesus didn't judge her. And if they hadn't judged her, they wouldn't have taken her to Jesus in the first place. I want to contend with you that in, instead of saying, well, they're at fault for bringing her to Jesus, Jesus, I want to contend with you instead that everything happens for a reason and that her being taken in the act and brought into the presence of Jesus is consistent with what we find the Bible teaches is God's course in our sin. God confronts us with our sin. God doesn't let us hide our sin. God wants us to face him with our sin. And, uh, and it, we find it over and over in the Bible when Adam and Eve sinned. Remember, they heard the, heard the Lord coming in the cool of the garden. And what do they do? As soon as they, they know that they've sinned and they're naked and they're ashamed. And so they hear God coming. And what is their first reaction is to hide from God. But God didn't say, oh, well, I guess they don't want to talk to me today. Do you notice that? I mean, sometimes we do that. You know, call a person a couple of times, they don't answer the phone. Well, maybe they don't want to talk today. You go to the door, knock on the door. You can hear them in the house, but you know they won't answer the door. Well, they just don't want to talk to me today, and so we go home. God, Jesus, God doesn't stop knocking. 
He doesn't stop knocking. I've told you this story before. Some of you remember this story. When this is a this is a Colorado young preacher story. This happened to me. I, we belonged to a church in Colorado when I was just learning how. To, I was assistant pastor, learning how to be a pastor. And we um, the church that we went to would go out door knocking on a regular basis. There was a guy um, that uh, he'd go out visiting, and he was just real. Fellow. So he goes to this house and he knocks on the door and he can hear the people inside the, in the house. He can hear them inside the house. So when he, they don't answer the door, he walks over to the side of the house by the window. The, the window, the bottom, is one of those houses, you know, where it's got a kind of a, a daylight basement thing. So the bottom of the living room window is up here and he's jumping up. I know you're in there, coward! Open the door! I know you're in there! <laughs> That's probably not what you and I should do. <laughs> I'm not saying we should do that, but I am saying that Jesus doesn't quit. He doesn't knock on the door and say, well, they're not in, don't want to, they must not be home. I can remember when I first started going to church, you know, my pastor, I got, I started going to church and found out real early, you know, that one of the things that Baptists do is they like go out and invite people to come to church and they soul win, which scared the living fire out of me. And so, uh, I mean, the whole idea of doing this is a terrifying thing to me that we're, you know, that you're actually going to go to someone you don't know and you're going to go to their house and you're going to ask them, if you die today, do you know for sure you're going to go to heaven and talk to them? And that scared, uh, I mean, it just scared the, the stuffing out of me. And uh, so I, but you know what, you know, they don't require you to do it. Nobody makes you do that. And so I thought I'm okay, I'm safe, except I got hurt on the job. And being hurt on the job, I had a month off. I was home for a month. And my pastor found out that I was, gonna, that I was home all day, every day. And so then pastor started coming to my house. And then it wasn't but a week into my being home, pastor says, hey, I'm going to go out and visit so-and-so. Will you come with me? And so I had to start going out on visitation. And then I began, so I'd pray like that. I'd pray, God, please don't let anyone be home. Please, God, don't let them be home, please. It doesn't matter if, you, if no one's home because your preacher, he's going to talk to everyone. He's going to talk to the people in the street. He's going to, I mean, if they're not, the people in the house are going to talk to anybody. Everyone is on a divine appointment with the preacher, and it's just going to happen. Anyway, so uh, it, what I'm saying here is that uh, G, uh, Jesus isn't going to let you and I come to that place where we say, I don't want to talk to the Lord about this thing and him. So he's going to say, well, they don't really want to talk about their sin so he backs off. Jesus doesn't back off of our sin. And I think the reason why, I think God allowed this woman to get caught and I think he, God allowed them to bring her to, uh, uh, to him uh, even though they didn't really, they, the, the Pharisees and scribes didn't believe Jesus was who he said he was but, uh, uh, and they have ulterior motives and all those things but I think what's happening is the, the will of God. He is bringing her uh, to Jesus so that he can deal with and confront her sin because no one ever really gets over their sin until they get, front, until they get confronted with their sin. Especially not confronted by men as much as by God. Adam and Eve. Uh, Cain, when he killed Abel, God confronted him. Um, you know, where's your brother? God knew where Abel was. God knew what happened. Cain, am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes, you are. In this case, especially since you're the one who did to him what's been done to him. Yes, it's very right for me to talk to you about this kind of thing. When Jacob fled from his brother, uh, remember, you know, the Esau Jacob thing, and Jacob flees from his brother, God confronted him on the way out of town. He's on his way fleeing from the promised land. He's going to go to Haran, find himself on a pretense, find himself a wife. But before he leaves the promised land, God's Holy Spirit came to him, or God's angel came to him and spoke to him and said, Now listen, if you'll be in the way... You know, I'm going to bring you back to this place, and i got a plan for your life. When Moses killed the Egyptian, uh, he hid the body of the Egyptian, but he's discovered anyway, and God confronted him. It's 40 years later before God confronts him, but eventually God confronts him there in the wilderness, uh, uh, there at the burning bush, and confronts him with it. You're not going to get away with your sin. Sooner or later, God's going to confront you and I with our sins. When David sinned with Bathsheba, God confronted him. He sent Nathan the prophet to, you know, confront him with his sin, and uh, it didn't always happen. The confrontation didn't always happen the same way and it didn't always involve the same consequences, but you'll find throughout the Bible that God confronts our sin. And, and that's a blessing, by the way, not a curse. 
That's a blessing, not a curse, because it's only when we come face to face with our sin and we acknowledge it for what it is, when we confess that our, uh, that our sin is, is a sin against God, when we make appropriate restitution for our sins, when a restitution is the right thing to do, it's only when we do that that we can find freedom and release from the bondage and the guilt of the sin that's in our life. To, to continue in sin will only lead to further min misery. To excuse our sin will only aid us in continuing in that sin. To try to hide our sin from God will only trap us in guilt, but to confront the sin will lead to victory and joy and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a good thing she's caught and then she's confronted. I notice the third thing that happens in this passage, not only is she caught and confronted, but she's not condemned. And of course, we all like that part. Look at verses 10 and 11. And she's not convinced. And, I, and I'm going to skip through all of that. You know, the writing on the ground. And uh, that's a whole new sermon, a whole different sermon. I'm going to, uh, to pass on that today. We're going to go down to verses 10 and 11. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none, of, none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. And we'll stop right there for right now. She's not condemned. Now, I'm studying these passages this week, getting ready for this message, and, and something that comes to my mind as I'm, as I'm studying and preparing for that this week, and uh, two verses that, that, that I think apply right here that are appropriate to this passage. First one, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 4. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Not just God, but God and man. Um, I'm also reminded of Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. It's speaking about Jesus. It says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Did you notice in this passage that she's not only not condemned by Jesus, she's not condemned by men. Jesus so works things in her life that he looks at her and says, Hath no man condemned thee? No man, my Lord. Neither do I condemn thee. If you let me allow, she, he's brought her to a place where she has favor with both God and man in this passage of Scripture. There's no, no man to condemn her, and Jesus didn't condemn her either. And that's, that's exactly what the Christian faith seeks to do. Not just to give a person where they can say, well, I'm forgiven by God, but also so that we have a, a place in this life where, there, where we have uh, favor with men, a uh, purpose in, uh, for our life and favor with men. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we can have favor with God, but through obedience to the Word of God, we find favor with men. Let me just, the Bible isn't just a religious book. A lot of times people like to think of it that way. It's not just a, a religious book. The Bible was never intended, it was never intended that the Bible would be pulled out just for use at church and at church services and religious holidays. God's, God's plan was that the Word of God would be employed throughout our day, uh, all the days of our life. Think about Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Another passage is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and, thy, and thy, they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. God's saying this, he's saying in both of those passages, I want the Word of God to be uh, part of your life, not only when you're in church, not only when you're doing religious things, but all day long, every single day. And he says, if you'll do that, then you'll find that your way is made prosperous and you'll have good success. What he's saying is, is if you will not only use the Bible for a plan of salvation, a way to get saved, but if you will live what the Word of God teaches, you'll have favor not only with God being saved, but with man, you'll have success and prosperity. Not prosperity so much, and I'm not talking about financially, but I'm talking about favor. Your life will make a purpose, it will make a difference in this life. Your life will have purpose and make a difference in the world around you. And the reason why some have never succeeded it well as Christians is because they've separated their faith from their life. And, the, you know, what I do for my faith is one thing, and what I do for my living and what I do in my home is something different.
And, you know, I come to church, and when I'm at church, I do certain things that we do at church, and it's my relationship with God. But when I'm at home, I want to be able to relax and let down my hair, and I want to just be who I am. Or when I'm at work, it's a whole different story. You can't make it in the work environment. If you live, you know, those goody-two-shoe Christian kind of ways. And so when I'm at work, I have to be one kind of person. And when I'm at church, I'm another kind of person. And when I'm at home, I want to be a whole different kind of a person like that. And, and that kind of life <coughs> doesn't really uh, succeed as a, as a Christian. And um, uh, God doesn't bless in that kind of a way. We, we're, we're, we're supposed to modify how we behave by what we believe spiritually. And when we do that, then we can experience favor with both God and man too. That doesn't mean that everyone's going to like us. It doesn't mean that we're going to have lots of money and get promotions at, at work. It just means that if we will not only come to church and learn the Word of God and worship God in church, but if we will uh, practice the Word of God and obey the Word of God in how we conduct our marriage and how we, uh, 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 the, the kind of integrity that we have on the job site and, uh, and how we uh, the kind, choose the kind of friends that we have and who it is that we associate with, if we we'll use the Word of God for all those things, then we will find that our life can be successful and we can, be, uh, we can have favor with both God and man in this world. Uh, men won't be able to find any reason to accuse you. They won't, not that they won't accuse you as a Christian, but God just says this. He says, listen, if they're going to accuse you, don't let, it be, uh, don't let it be because of a sin that you've committed. If they want to accuse you for being a Christian, that's okay. If they're going to accuse you for a sin, make sure that it's a false accusation, that they can't prove it because you didn't do it. And what he's telling us in the Word of God is that as Christians, we are to stop doing the sin. In fact... Jesus is going to look right at this woman and command her to change her life. Look at verse 11, the last phrase of the here. He says, neither do I condemn thee. And then the phrase that we all wished, not we all, the phrase that so many wished wasn't in the passage. Go and sin no more. Here's a simple phrase that is so very often overlooked. Um, most people just want to look at this. Jesus didn't condemn her, but but they don't want to face up to the fact that Jesus didn't excuse her sin or ignore her sin. He didn't condone her sin. He forgave her sin and commanded her to turn from her sin. And here's where most of us depart from the passage, and here's where most of us need to come again face to face with ourselves. It is not okay to keep up a life of sin, it's not okay. Just because there was a day in your life when you came to Lord Jesus Christ and you asked the Lord to forgive you of your sins and He promised that He did that, that and you have the assurance in your heart that He has forgiven you, that He is preparing for you a place in heaven and that you are saved for sure and forever and you cannot lose your salvation, that does not give you the right to continue in sin. That doesn't, because I'm saved and God's going to forgive me, when I get to heaven, he'll take care of my sin problem. That's not what the Bible teaches. The, Jesus said, listen, I'm not going to, I'm forgiving you right now. I'm not going to condemn you. But when you leave my presence, I want you to walk out of this place to sin no more. Stop that. Whatever it is that is your sin, and you come up with all the excuses and the reasons why it's okay for you to do this, and why, you know, and no one should be judging you, and no one should be condemning you, and, and there's forgiveness with God and everything else, and why can't people, instead of all that, just realize this, here is what Jesus said, I'm, I'm not going to condemn you, but I am telling you, sin no more. Stop that, is what he's telling. It's not okay to stay like you've always been. Well, you know, if Jesus didn't want me to do this sin, he'd give me the ability not to sin. If Jesus didn't want me to do this sin, he'd make it where I didn't like the sin. Years ago, but I like this thing. I want to do this thing. And I can't give this thing up. I like doing it. And, and uh, listen, it, 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 all of those are excuses. It's, it's not okay to keep it up just because you like it. It's not, it's not okay to reason that, that, uh, that you're this way, that, that you're the way that you are because God made you that way. And, and, uh, and, uh, and this is the way you're going to stay until you die. It's not okay to figure that since God has forgiven you of your sin, then you can go on in your sin. It is the will of God that you and I, sin no more and stop the sin in life so I'm going to get ready to close right now you know what your sin is 
<clears throat> one of the things that a, a preacher has to a preacher has to do is he has to rely um, on a congregation's own sensibility. Could call it imagination. I, you know, I I can't preach on everything at one time. So if I was to sit here, if I was to give right now a list of 300 sins, I'd probably miss your sin. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to ask you to figure it out on your own. You know what your sin is. You know that God has already caught you. You know what your sin is. Here's the thing to do. Confess that sin to God at this altar today. You know what it is. Just bring it to God today, right now. And then, by the grace of God, determine that you'll walk away from the altar. Go, he said. That you'll walk away from the altar. Determine that you will wage war against that sin and that you will overcome it. Go and sin no more.